gentlemen, you are both drunk on cosmic wine. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Mark Sylvester. And I'm Dr. Richard Schulman. This, this is, is All Psych. Psych. She has spoken. Here we are. Hey, I wore a white shirt today in honor of sensory deprivation. And I wore a David Gilmore shirt in honor of you. And I put. Pretty cool, huh? That's awesome. Yeah. I, and I, I, if uh, I didn't know you were going to wear it, I would have worn a matching one. Well, I could have was going to give you a Hendrix shirt. You could wear the Hendrix shirt. I wear the Gilmore shirt. It's kind of a community, you we're know, one. Kum, kumbaya moment. We're all know. one. Speaking of Sometimes. kumbaya, yes. Mental wealth us. Ah, mental wealth. Okay, here's your mental wealth tip for the day. This is for um, probably all of us because we all get sick every so often. But anyone with a chronic illness, let's say, needs to be very careful not to let your illness become your identity. A lot of people will organize their lives around, even around uh, mental health kind of stuff. I'm a, I'm depressive. I'm an anxiety person. Uh, even trauma, which we deal with all the time. So be very careful. Check in if you're doing that. Does that still apply to terminal illnesses? In my world, it does, yeah. I, I mean, your, your identity is uh, of a, a human being, you know, and, and I guess, you know, and, and I deal with people who are approaching end stages of life. And um, a lot of them, a lot of them fear death. I'm not so sure that they don't actually fear life because they, they kind of shut down, but they'll do that. And I, I fight that. You're a human being first, always. I like and that. I, I'm remembering a story. I was with um, my most beloved professor in grad school and we were walking, we passed by this homeless guy. And, and when we got to his office, he liked to jam. He goes, Mr. Schulman, we passed a man in the street please give me his diagnosis. And I said, well, you know, it wasn't a hard, I think he's schizophrenic, probably catatonic type. He goes, very good. Now let me give you a more important question. How's he any different from you? I said, well, he has more symptoms than I do. <laughs> he says, uh, that's good because we're all more human than anything else. And we have to remember that. So that's all I like that. Mental wealth tip of the day. And what a good and segue. A story to go along with it. It's a good segue too. To, yes. You know, to help ground you and to help the non-ordinary mind and to help get you back to your true nature and, and your true self. Hey, let's talk about isolation tanks, flotation tanks, sensory deprivation. We Lots are about we are about an exploration of human consciousness here. And this is a fun one, and I'm I'm a oh, little yeah. I think we I, I kind of I'm surprised that we didn't come up with this idea sooner because it's really definitely on point with the non-ordinary right. mind. And, you know, a lot of these research tanks were around, I think, around World War II, but nobody used them. Basically, nobody used them. And um, no one really knew what to make of it and what they were for and why they were doing it. And uh, John Lilly, who we get to in a minute, kind of is a lot of people consider the father father of the modern flotation tank theory. But um, I don't know the, the the whole thinking or the definition, I guess you want to say that is the whole the goal is to deprive, reduce, isolate your your senses, your perceptions. It's this intentional, deliberate reduction of the stimuli that we all are constantly getting awake or asleep and um interesting stuff happens when you demand the brain to sample reality without its usual five senses how's that for a definition i just pulled that deep i kind of i kind of like that i think that uh, that kind of says it all and you know I we think we talked a little bit about partial sensory stuff, which we can touch on. I mean, you can deprive yourself a bit of vision by doing the, the, the you know, the ping pong ball thing yeah. or, or well, he was, he was, that's called the Gonsfeld effect. He was doing that in the thirties. 
Yeah, I kind of feel like I've seen videos of those people with the ping pong balls, but maybe that was Chuck Yeager and the one thing. <laughs> Nine G's or whatever. Or, or Chuck E. Cheese. It could have been that guy, you know. Could have been. It looks, looked like a little like both, but you know, you could put a hood over someone's head. You could put the earmuffs or, or noise canceling. Um, of course, the tank, the idea of the tank is to decrease not only light, sound, um, and smells to some to the best degree, but your sense of taste and proprioception, which if you're floating on the super salty water, is a good way. I think about 95 degrees is what I, I vaguely remember which is our usual skin temperature. It's a couple degrees right, right. cooler, but you want to you wanna match that as close as possible because like you said, the whole point is to <clears throat> eliminate all of this sensory stuff. So if, like you were saying before, if you bump into the side, you float over and bump into the side, that's going to be a tactile input. And well, that's, that's what happened to me when I did it. it um, I would start to zone out and then pop I'd bump, I'd bump into the side it, it totally derails the yeah. isolation of it it kind just woke me up you know i was i was in a nice relaxed zoned out place you know in la laville somewhere and it brought me back to sarasota yeah what's creepy is everybody's different so somebody's skin temperature might be 96 and the next person's could be 94. And if you have the tank water set at 95, which they're very good at holding those temperatures, by the way, and changing along with your body heating the water throughout the uh, duration of the float session, even a degree off can bring you back to your body, can, can create a tactile. And I watched a lot of videos in preparing for this. And a lot of people talk that the air temperature within the tank itself can be another thing, or sometimes you get condensation stuck to the roof and a drip will fall and make a sound or worse, hit you in the forehead or something like that. So it's kind of seems like it's an art. I've, I've done it too. Um, it was a long time ago and I don't remember um, meeting any purple people or traveling to parallel universes. Uh, I'm open to that, but. But I'm wondering, you know, and I didn't come across this in the prep, and if you didn't, uh, then we're both going to look like we didn't have it. Have they done studies where they looked at the brain states that people go into on this? Because I remember when, when we talked to Nickel Backrack, the brain trainer guy, and my experience with the brain training is I could get myself into some pretty deep brain states with the neurofeedback. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people get into those kind of gamma states or theta states through um, through the flotation tank, but I would predict that they could. Well, in honor of, I, I, well, I called him William Hurt. I really should have said Dr. Jessup, but I, I don't know if most of our viewers will get that or if they yeah, one, one of my girlfriends, uh, uh, after seeing that movie said to me, well, are you, she said to me, are you okay, Dr. Jessup? You know? I don't well, know. Did, did you that growl at her? And leap across no, the room just, like this uh, it was the la la ville effect i wasn't i didn't regress into it into an ape but it was more you know being uh out on the out on the edge psychically i think <laughs> yeah yeah something like that oh sorry there's a reflection off my mug <laughs> off your mug which one both there you go so did you know sensory deprivation has been used in various alternative medicines and in psychological experiments throughout the 1950s and beyond? Well, I, I had an idea they might be. Why don't you educate me? Oh, I just did. That, that's okay. all I, I feel. I actually feel better now. Yeah. They also use it to uh, study uh, how prone people were to hallucinations. And worse. And worse. And I, you know, worse. I thought about... Does it get worse? I thought about not including that because, but it's important because a lot of times extended or forced sensory deprivation. And again, I don't know if we're talking eight hours or eight days. I'm assuming eight days is worse, but what will happen is, I think if you're a prisoner of war, you're being tortured, the set and setting of the isolation or sensory depri deprivation, or I doubt they're putting you in a flotation tank is going to create a bad trip equivalent, kind of like somebody that, I don't know, 
does a drug in a dangerous situation or, or, or uh, unfamiliar situation, it can, it can provoke extreme anxiety, certainly hallucinations, but bizarre thoughts, to, uh, ego dissolution, which can be very uh, ego dystonic or distressing to people, temporary selflessness, you know, of course, prolonged cases, depression and, and more serious traumatic type of long-term consequences. So it's not always been used for good. I do know that the armed forces within NATO used it as a means of interrogating prisoners within international treaty obligations. Wow. And at that time, it didn't violate them. But the European Court of Human Rights ruled you know, that the use of the five techniques, which I think the British security forces are using in Northern Ireland at the time, basically amounted to cruel and unusual, or I think they called it inhumane and degrading treatment, mm -hmm. basically torture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, but it's also apparently been used to improve concentration, focus, creativity as well. That's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to yeah, focus on. Because good stuff, positive things. You know, they've used they've used blasting rock and roll and shocking people to not let them sleep and all kinds of torture methods. I think that the isolation kind of like, you know, when you're in prison and you get thrown in solitary, no, social, social isolation. I think that's what what's more traumatic. It's not like, hey, these guys force people into flotation tanks and they have bad right. experiences. <laughs> But it's certainly possible. It's the, in some ways, it's a lot of like near-death experiences, which we've talked about, that it's much more fun and, and common to talk about the uh, positive ones and, the, and how life-changing they can be. But hellish near-death experiences do occur. And so the, you could have uh, a rough experience, theoretically, as well. But well, I mean, when they when they talk about the contraindications for doing the sensory uh, deprivation floating tank, you know, one of them is if you have uh, severe mental health problems. So, as defined and classified and by ranked by whom? Know, by we don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, by the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, I guess. Um, you know, look. Can, it's, I, can it, I change? It, can I change my main my name? Oh no, never mind. That's the name I want. I said I was William Hurt. It was. I'm actually John Lilly today. Are you John Lilly? I am. I actually actually think that would be cool. I thought John, it was John Lilly was a really cool guy. You know, he was a cool guy. Uh, he was a smart guy. He resonated with me because he was both a physician and an engineer. Um, but the older he got, and, and some of his books are really, you know, we were talking about meta programming and meta programming, the human biocomputer is the name of that book we were trying to come up with before. Um, really, com really hard reading, some of it. Yeah. Day of the Dolphin was great, Center of the Cyclone, Dyadic Cyclone. Yeah, I, I didn't get beyond that. I didn't get to the programming book. The, that one was really dense. And I'm thinking, wow, I can see why the vast majority of people don't get this guy. He he thought like an engineer. And I can relate to that. And that's one of the reasons why I liked him. But also realized he was not effective. He wasn't a great uh, science educator. He wasn't a good... Um, and I don't know that that was even his fault. He was, he was a... Um... He was a seeker. He was a, I, I don't know if this is going to come out, a psychonaut, like a, yep, like an astronaut that would go into the psyche. He was an explorer. How about that? He was definitely you know, a psychonaut. Much, much more than a, than a, than a physician or a scientist, really much more of an explorer, an explorer of the psyche. Well, and a lot of the work, his legacy, yes, he kind of is considered the father of the modern flotation tank, which he, got into big time in 1954 and pretty much did these experiences until 19, I want to say 70. Mm -hmm. But he also did a lot of acid um, <laughs> in the tanks. And, you know, we, we talked about Altered States, the movie with William Hurt, I think 1980. Uh, it was a little, I think it was a little later than 80, but it was in that. It's been over 40 years. And what year is it on the internet right now? I don't know. I don't know. I thought, it, I thought it was actually late 80s, but um, 
what's that's okay well they celebrated their 40th anniversary so it was definitely before oh well that would then uh, then i stand corrected but lsd you know was used a lot in the 50s and 60s um therapeutically and then it became illegal um so i don't know i hate to be like a purist here but the whole point of sensory deprivation and isolation and the flotation and you're literally doing everything to remove external stimuli doesn't seem congruent with taking a drug whether that's marijuana joe rogan which i think i have a i have a little slideshow here coming up i want to show in a minute but i think joe rogan ha has a lot of experience with floating i think he has his own personal float tank yeah i'm sure he does um but he likes to eat marijuana and do that and then john lilly was using lsd and probably ketamine and I think that, that the issue really wasn't the, the pristine uh, experience of a float tank. It was an exploration of how do you get to, to coin a phrase, non-ordinary mind states. Yeah, I just... Would you, you bristle at, at the idea that he took slightly. acid and went in there? I mean, like, what are they trying? They weren't necessarily trying to prove anything. Like you said, they're just using this... Just exploring. For yeah for exploration but to me it just seemed more like a i don't know controlled experience to not always have an external stimulation like a drug on board because then let's say you have an experience you're immediately wondering okay was that experience the drug or possibly something else revealing something very deep well i had a therapist when i was real out in California when I lived out there who um you know it's California I mean what the hell um I was really into all this stuff and and <laughs> he called me an altered states junkie he says finally uh listen you do this stuff but you don't think about it because next time you do one of these things I want you to think about it for six months before you do another one it sobered me actually because what I was doing was I was I was using it like a trip to Disneyland uh, I wasn't um, actually learning all that much. I was having these intense experiences, but they didn't really mean anything. And and if you if you want to find, you know, Lily, who was in my mind a great explorer and, and actually a genius, because he thought differently. He came up with all this really interesting stuff. Now it may not mean anything in our practice life, but it sure is interesting. Yeah, you know, he supposedly was communicating with aliens. He talked about the Earth Coincidence Control Office. A lot of his later stuff seemed, for the layperson, quite psychotic. Uh, maybe not just the layperson. I, I don't think most people knew what the space cadet was doing. And, you know, is Yeah, but you know what? If you, if, if you take Alice in Wonderland, that's kind of psychotic too from a certain point Super of view psychotic. you know but we take it as a classic so i, I i'm gonna give john lily a little more credit than just i love the, i mean i love that he's, that he's nuts you know i wish that he made more of an indelible mark on consciousness and which was what i would think his goal would have been um but you know what he his daughter and his, but mainly him what was famous for was of course interspecies communication right um, right right the communicating with dolphins, um, telepathic communication with dolphins. They had some right. really interesting experiments. And what's funny, when I lived in Miami, I lived less than a block from where his research with the dolphins was. It was in, really? it was in uh, Coconut Grove. It was in Coconut Grove, a little, little uh, harbor there or whatever. And to this day, his daughter still lives down there and does work in that field. So he, which is a great field, you know, that's kind of like uh, Jane Goodall or something. Yeah, pretty cool. With the chimps and the monkeys. But he, you know, I, I was telling you before, Lily did not like that term sensory deprivation because mm -hmm. he did not, you know, firmly did not believe that we are only a sum of our sensory inputs you know we're actually not depriving um completely depriving your brain of, se of sensory input 
what you're doing is shutting down the outside world, you know, not unlike meditation, except for whatever reason, it does, it goes deeper than meditation. And he would describe it not as an ice, you know, he used the word isolation tank, but he always says that's a cover score story to scare off the panty wastes um, because he didn't want the faint of heart doing this type of stuff and he didn't like the sensory deprivation so he did sort of settle on isolation tank i guess on the on the nomenclature but he was really clear this was a doorway to the universe it was not an isolation tank this allows you to escape your body and become pure spirit in a way that i'm sure is accessible through other means that we've talked about but this one is kind of unique in that most people definitely have strange and eerie and pro often profound and profoundly positive experiences well but when you when you're in a sensory deprivation tank of course if the lights are out and you're floating you can still hear now they have this thing called an n and i wrote it down an echoic chamber anechoic yeah that you well, you would know how to get that sound and they say that nobody can really stay in there for more than about 45 minutes before they start to go crazy. Um, all it, it, um, it dampens any sound. So all you really, you can hear your heart beating, let's say, or, you know, um, your neck cracking. It's like a minus 20 decibels, you know, because you have to have a certain level of ambient sound before you can hear anything. Yeah. And, uh, they say it makes you feel crazy. Now, you know, you, you, if you clap your hands in there, apparently you don't get any echo. So it sounds eerie. We locate ourselves in space. And I wonder sometimes about we locating our identity through the echo of sound. If I talk, the sound will bounce all around the room and then I can locate where I am in the room based on the feedback I'm getting yeah i mean you know we definitely do that but some like bats and whales and things yeah they may not but obviously. but i'm just talking about it from the point of view of what happens i don't know if the right word to your brain not really to your psyche that's really kind of what we're talking about how do we how do we respond do we take that experience and commune with angels or do we just kind of get scared and go nuts well, you said it well before the show that similar, I guess, to, I forget how exactly you said it, but similar to medica med meditation, your, your goal here is to remove sensory input with the expectation that you will reduce consciousness to nothing, right? Something like that. You, you know, we, we talk about um, ego death and, you know, you can't be nobody until you're somebody. Okay, so you can't have no senses. It's kind of weird because how do you know you have no senses? You would have to know, know something in order to have that. So there's this kind of odd perspective that it would take. But the bottom line is having, I never went in that anechoic chamber, but, but I have been in the tank and it was an, it was an odd, how about that, an uncanny, experience well i guess what i'm trying to say is it's like uh you know when him talking about a doorway to the universe if if you're reducing your sensory input rather than it coming to a point of nothingness or near nothingness you kind of pass through this portal and then the brain let's say it's the brain who knows maybe it's your soul backing through your pineal gland and reconnecting with your higher self or the universe or something really cool we don't know about like aliens and, um but it does seem like the world opens back up your inner world in you know maybe that's the definition of hallucination is that you know you're, you're responding to internal stimuli internally generated um ghost sensations and there's really no way to know you ready for my slideshow i am always ready all for right seatbelt yourself on because i've never done this i, I never before. take the seatbelt off in this chair mark can you can you see it uh no well unless you are the slide you can see me but no slide yeah I, I see oh here we go 
Oh, there we go. Now I yeah. can see it. It's pretty cool. So I guess uh, here, here, here's the, uh, some salt water and this etheric body separating from the human body. I don't know. I just like that. A cool color. From the physical like that. body. That, from the physical body. Yeah. Because and um, we're all human. Let's see the next. Uh, the next slide there we go can you see this yeah yeah that's a pretty cool tank these are like some of the newer ones there there's actually quite a lot out in the market i i well, apparently that doesn't work there's, oh, no, there's, a, there's a picture of me when i didn't have a beard oh no that's william hurt i'm sorry oh maybe that's you this was a great movie i remember watching it um in the movie, he and these were some of the oldest I, I, isolation tanks were vertical, and he was vertical in the movie. But um, m the first one, the last girl that we saw, which now I don't know how to go back, um, is a more modern clamshell, and they're they're super advanced in terms of the biologic filtering and the temperature control and the salt homeostasis and the water level and all of that is pretty neat but this is a great movie great scene from the movie um he's got the eegs and the ekgs and all of that on himself as well but if you haven't seen the movie oh, it's, if, you, if you're interested in non-ordinary mind please see altered states is and that here, is that uh, john there here is a little bit, uh, well young john lily young -ish. yep the uh the psychonaut we were speaking of, and I'm uh, named after here today in honor of his uh, uh, life and work. I thought I'd put a good picture in there. Let me see what else we got. I think I got some more flotation tanks. Oh, yes. This is from the movie. Oh, yes. I, I remember the, it well. The vertical tank. I always wondered if he had fish in there, you know, go swimming by him, you know. No, that would wreck the sensory deprivation. Probably would. A piranha yeah. bite. But it would be saltwater fish. For sure. uh, I liked it that he had the little space helmet on, you know. That was kind of cool. The diving bell. Yeah. Now this is like, oh, I don't, I think this, I don't know. I think this is about $40,000, this one. And I don't, I don't know if she comes with it or not for that price. Extremely expensive. I think the entry level ones are around ten thousand dollars. Why does it have like the you know, the ET thing on the head there? The, the blue thing light. On the, the, the thing on the top is that. That's the clamshell. That's to help kind of uh, attenuate the sound and. Um, oh, oh, it, that's what closes. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you got to climb in. Like, that's the hatch, so, man. So that's the hatch. I that's got. That's the hatch to the escape capsules. Okay. But this is another design that's pretty neat. Uh, let's see if I can figure this one out. Now, this is similar to the one that probably we floated in here in yes, town. Yes, yes, yes. Um, kind of a front loader, I guess. And at, and at the end of the movie, they, oh, he yeah. goes into one like this. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Now, now I got to go watch the movie. I'm disappointed I didn't watch it before... Uh, we should have a have an altered states party, you know. We can all like float around, float and, next yeah. to each other. So okay, yeah. here is the uh, the Joe Rogan. Uh, this is, looks like his personal tank, and um, you know he he's got a five o'clock shadow here. Um, <laughs> the shadow is up in his in his temporal lobe there. Yeah, I don't know what's going on up there. I think he's uh, he must have ate too many pot brownies or something. <laughs> but I just I like this picture because uh, yeah. you know I I've, I've always liked Joe Rogan I find him kind of an interesting guy to interview people he has talked about flotation tanks some on his podcast he talks a lot more about drugs and psychedelic experiences um but he, he I, I've I really kind of come to respect how much work he's done to raise consciousness awareness mm -hmm. and to get people talking about it, thinking about it. And certainly he's a big proponent of, of the flotation and it's a big part of his life and his creativity and his centering and his balance. So homage 
to the smoking Joe. Yeah, maybe he just likes getting high. All right, that one just kind of got thrown in there by accident. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's a good accident. Yeah, I mean, that was a fun one. <laughs> that's that's what I got for the slide. I like that. I like that stuff. That's good. It's, uh, you know, it keeps the sensory stimulation of the visual cortex going to have a few of those it, things. It keeps us locked in our bodies, and it's certainly better than staring at our mugs. Well, not that much better. Um, okay. So we've been through sound deprivation and sensory deprivation. You know, we live in a touch starved society, especially since social distancing became the rage. You know, what? Um, but we were touch starved before, um, before uh, COVID. And they've, they've done experiments on, on the role of touch, especially in early uh, attachment kind of stuff super the, uh, important you know the uh the the experiment with the with the um the wire monkey mother and the uh and the fuzzy monkey uh harlow's ex experiment i actually one of my teachers in grad school is a guy named joe sadowski who worked for harlow hmm. and and you know how grad school works he says he said well you know harlow was a drunk and we did all the work but you know he got all the credit i said well <laughs> go figure but the bottom line is that stuff really worked. The touch created um, normal behavior, even though it wasn't a live mother. Having the, the fuzzy monkey to be fed through versus the wire one. The wire one created um, bizarre behaviors. Because, you know, you hug somebody, you get that oxytocin. And violent of behaviors too, right? Yes, yes. I remember they call them bizarre, but I'm sure violence was in there. It was, uh, I mean, I that experience was, I don't know, sad. Or that experiment seemed, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm a monkey lover, but it was a little sad. Oh my God, they did terrible things. I, I don't know that they could, they would be allowed to, to do some of the experiments they did. I remember when I was in my psychophysiology class years ago, the professor goes, well, here's a nice thing to do to a monkey, insert a ball bearing in his carotid artery and see how the, the you know, the arteries branch out. And I turn to my friend and goes, that's not a nice thing to do. I'm sorry. Yeah. So monkey anyway, too. it's just not a nice thing to do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What do you know about creativity and floating? Uh, well, I don't know. All I know is that I read that it can enhance creativity. It didn't really do that much for me but you know my unconscious is, is always wide open so getting it more wide open is not the goal well you might be just a lucky one for us mere mortals you know it, it, it it's, it's an <laughs> i don't it doesn't always feel lucky man it's an action step you know it takes discipline to to meditate it takes discipline to access any non-ordinary state um, i don't know i i spoke with a person who runs um ayahuasca groups and she said to me why don't why don't you come down and i and i said oh, i would never do that she said you would send the patient but you wouldn't go yourself and then she stopped and she goes oh your unconscious is always open isn't it i said yes you got that right I watched an interview last night of Megan Fox and I, whoever her current boyfriend is, I have somebody, I don't know, Sid Vicious, I don't know, Motor or something, something, some guy that we're both embarrassing ourselves not knowing. I thought she was still with Brian Austin Green, but apparently not. Some character. I don't know. He's some famous guy. However. Not, obviously not famous enough for me. Phil, I might be a little bit told for that that generation yeah, yeah he's i know he's younger than her and she's probably in her 30s but she right. openly talked on a couple talk shows about her experience with ayahuasca and kind of mm -hmm. you know how she thought it was going to be you know, like everywhere else in her, her universe people recognize her fawn on her coddle her roll out the red carpet she actually implied that she thought that that it would be that way in South America. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she tells the story about how, you know, she's just some grubby American in the middle of the jungle getting eaten by mosquitoes and they <laughs> force you to drink this stuff and everybody cheers you on because you have to vomit before you can do the experience. So it was kind of interesting. 
uh, to hear you, her talk. Do you about think that. that that psychedelics create a, a sensory deprivation in a way? Yes, absolutely. Um, it depends on the drug, but a hundred percent. You know, we we talked about the ketamine model for near death experiences. That was something I was always very interested in because it very quickly attenuates the workhorse neurotransmitter of the brain. I mean, it is literally an anesthetic. You can administer it and lovingly saw someone's leg off in the battlefield if you I had to. Lovingly would be the word, but yeah. okay. Well, you could do it violently. They're not going to wake up. They're not going to feel it. Oh, okay. So it literally <laughs> deprives them their senses. Now, what's interesting <laughs> is they don't go to sleep like they do other anesthetics. A lot of time they get pushed through consciously into their unconscious, which to me is exactly what the flotation tanks are doing. I, I had that experience with acupuncture, actually. It Some was like being did. in a wake, like a waking dream. I was awake, but I was... I was having this odd experience. I didn't, I mean, I thought I was walking around and talking to people, but I was lying on, you know, on a table with needles stuck in me, so. Yeah. I mean, is, is that what we're really going for with the sensory deprivation is, is to have some kind of, to coin a phrase, non-ordinary experience? I mean, that's what I'm the most interested in, but we can't glaze over the creativity piece we can't glaze over the relaxation and how it helps chronic pain how it helps concentration and fo uh, focus how it helps athletic uh performance how it helps generalized anxiety and high blood pressure how it improves cardiovascular health i mean i guess we just did glaze over it but all of that is important to but, but at risk of sounding like you know everything i see is a giant puzzle which of course that's what i do well all those things improve creativity if you experience them being relaxed and being able to connect with your unconscious and having less less pain and chronic pain and that whole other list of things that you said i don't know i think it helps your stuckness in your body be less worse so chronic pain is one of the worst because it's a constant you know booming voice in your brain that hey you need to pay attention to your body something's wrong with it you're you're you know but now an interesting thing is if you get people into enough excruciating pain it's particularly torture like uh, the waterboarding and the stuff they do like that the brain will actually dissociate to protect right. itself but that's in extreme cases and usually you just lose consciousness yeah you, so, you pass so out the pain in your mind and I, and this is you know, obviously opinion, is dissociation. What I say is fact. What are you talking about? Okay. In your fact, of of, instead of the mental wealth tip, we're going to have the Sylvester fact. <laughs> I like that. Because, you know, I trust you. The world. Of so so is, is dissociation a, hang on a reaction to sensory overload, which would create a shutdown of sensory input. Well, about a shutdown, but maybe a, a short circuit. Okay, short circuit is okay with me. I, it just, it's certainly a different mental state because I've observed it many, many times in people. The way I think about like dynamic neurophysiology, I, I like, you know me, I like metaphors, is kind of the fro frog in the pot thing. Okay. So anything that acutely changes your physiology has a greater potential to do something unusual. So, uh, yeah, impact, yeah, okay. you know, just like an impact with, you know, with your head against the concrete or, or, or in an accident, um, that's about as hard as it gets. And you literally are mechanically interrupting the normal neuronal transmission. Mm -hmm. And what do you get? You usually see stars, you could throw up. I mean, you really quickly get a change in the status quo. So a drug, whether you're talking about LSD that might come on more slowly or even an infusion or an IM of, of ketamine would very quickly change the, the brain's physiology. And it's not so much you went from state A to a different state B 
It's the gap and the speed that you change the state that matters. That's kind of why people can have seizures both coming on Xanax and coming off. So, so if you, so let's say this, so you go into the flotation tank and you do whatever you need to do to get in there. And, you gotta get uh, naked, by the way. We didn't mention that. Y- yeah, you gotta get naked. Yeah. They didn't like show that. Pictures, they, they, they didn't, didn't show that in the, you know, no. they didn't show that in those pictures that you had. They put the bikinis way. on them. But yeah, you, you have to take a shower beforehand to right, wash right. off oils and, and, so, you know, so okay, so now you now you go in there, and it, it was a very gradual thing for me. Do you think that it's more sudden for for most people when they when they do that? I mean, I, when I work with somebody, let's say in hypnosis, there are a few people that you could do anything, and they go, you know, sure, right. and they're in. But most people, you know, they're they need a little easing into it. Is that? I mean, it's not as acute as whacking your head on the windshield during a car accident or something. That would be good. But I don't think what I like about it is I don't think it uh, is as hasty. I mean, you're talking sometimes these. The other thing we didn't mention is sometimes these sessions usually, and again, there's only a couple of these in Florida that I know of. These sessions usually last an hour. Now, if you're out in California where you got a lot more hippie hippie psychonauts. A lot, of the, a lot of these people take drugs and go in them, like we talked about, but some of them will stay in the tank for eight, up to eight hours. So could you imagine like showing up at a business at 8 a.m. and floating there until 5 p.m.? So I, you know, whether it's an, an hour is pretty quick to change your, your state, to change your physiology. But I think it's somewhere in the middle between maybe the gradual changes that occur over repetitive Tai Chi, yoga, meditation, stuff like that, versus the sudden acute, like a drug administration or a traumatic injury. But I think it's more the removing of the sensory input that reveals- Yeah, I got it. Your conscious inner landscape, wherever it's coming from, whether it's uh, some primal brain or whether it's your spirit. So the administration of a, of a psychedelic or uh, another kind of drug, it may, I'm trying to puzzle this out in my head because I can see, okay, there's no input. So you get a certain reaction to there being no input. But why? So now you take uh, a psychedelic, which is gonna distort well, I don't know if that's the right word, change, distort is, 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 a, is a pejorative, but change the way you perceive reality. I'm not, you know, so I say, well, it distorts the consensus reality. It may open you to a, a bigger reality, maybe even a more truthful one, but that's not what we're really talking about here, is it? We're talking about what happens when there's no input. Well, then let's talk about the Gansfeld effect. Because what's interesting about that is it's specifically targeting, isolating, I guess, the visual stimulation, um, which we know a lot about and a, and a good chunk of the brain has evolved um, to, to deal with, process, sample, integrate vision like our vision so to me the, the and we rely heavily on our more on our visions our primary sense so when you when you during the Gansfeld experience when you you know you do the ping pong balls over your eyes and you're scattering light so that it's equally uh basically you're putting yourself into like the construct in the matrix you're in a uh, a white in, room. A, in a snowstorm shall we say a blizzard which whiteout, whiteout conditions. again, I would argue isn't true sensory deprivation in the isolation. Well, well the Gonsfeld is, 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 sounds more like overload than deprivation. Well, what's interesting is how quickly the brain will fill in visual impressions. Exactly. And, and it will um, uh, lead very quickly to hallucinations. And you're not even messing with sound, you know, touch, all the proprioception, taste. So it's kind of suggestive of what the rest of the senses are doing when they're 
either isolated or attenuated or at least repetitively stimulated. It's pretty, um, it's pretty amazing stuff because human beings are creatures of pattern. We look for patterns in the world, I guess, because we don't want to reinvent, we don't want to reinvent the world. Um, anything you do that were performance oriented, you're going to rehearse. That's why but, Lily was so smart about the meta programming because our, we, our brains are, why are all the lights going on? Our brains are computers. And so that for our brain to understand something, it has to compute it, regardless of whether or not we have a soul or not. So everything is a comparison. Until it isn't. Until you step into a flotation tank. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. But, you know, the, the, the Gansfeld, I think that what happens is that white, let's just call it white visual noise, yeah. it begins to attenuate, the brain accommodates it fairly quickly. It, it um, will, the brightness will, will go down. At least your perception of the black brightness will go down, which is kind of crazy. That that's uh, yeah. I think you said that's called the fade out, and um, you know the retinal cells become more active. You may start to see actually retinal images, floaters. You're actually paying attention to the retina itself, which is a phenomenally complex, probably the most complex part of our body. Most people don't know that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it's extremely complex. So, you, you know, you're starting to see the blood vessels within your own eye, which you would, your brain normally filters all that crap out because it's noise, essentially. And, uh, you know, your vision will go from white to gray. And then, you know, you can see geometric patterns and lines and zigzags and blobs of colors, kind of acidy. Um, and this can occur in five minutes. Well, because the brain wants to fill in something. You said the brain frantically seeks outside stimuli. And I said, why? Because <laughs> it, it doesn't want to die. It's lonely? <laughs> no, it's looking, look, I think that, that our brain and our whole being is set up for survival. You know, we, we learn patterns so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And we can see when there's a, a a change in the pattern that would require us to respond to it. You know, I think those are survival oriented kinds of things, but you know, we're at a place where, you know, most of us can survive without, you know, the saber tooth tiger isn't coming anytime soon. And we're looking for some kind of higher meaning, some kind of higher explanation to life. So, my theory yes i would like that is that we most likely have a soul and it's the puppet master that controls our body and it always has been it always is and it always will be so there's a timeless tesseract like existence of it that we only enter into a world of uh time and space and consensus reality there's, but, a, there's a Gilmore Sheriff in town, buddy. There's a Gilmore Sheriff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, thank but, God. I mean, that, that but if you, if you look, if you actually, as a Pink Floyd fan, which I know you are. Fanatic. You're very good at being a Pink Floyd fan. They will be talking about non-ordinary mind in, in most of their uh, records. Learning to fly is a great one. Is the ecstasy experience, not literally ecstasy, but the ecstatic experience of actually being in a plane being at the control of its own destiny great song great song but your soul never sleeps your soul never grows old your soul never was not ex in existence and so what it that would that would be one possible explanation of why our brains are always working when we're awake they're working just as hard. And some neuroscientists argue harder while we're asleep. What's the purpose of sleep? What's the person who's dreaming? Um, and most likely they're working hard when we're not awake or asleep, but we're in a non-ordinary flotation tank. And possibly then we're getting closer to our source. Well, the thing is in our ordinary uh, reality, 
the brain is is local but in this expanded reality the mind is not local well and and sleeping and dreaming is one step closer so this consensus digital reality you and i are having this lovely max headroom like talk would be the furthest away and we get into social media and all this crap we're getting further 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 away from source but dreams can be precognitive dreams can resolve traumas Dream, dreams can remind you recover memories that's closer step in the isolation tank i think you're getting even closer yet maybe uh, lily's right it pumps us through the uh, doorway to the other side of the universe and uh, towards our original state of being if our goal as psycho psychonauts here is to make the unconscious conscious it actually could provide a bridge between the two that makes sense to me i think it's our only hope for humanity i don't agree besides david gilmar or pink floyd <laughs> he's a hell of a guitar player hey, well i wish we could play his music but i think we'll get banned okay but secret watch the intro and see if you recognize that chord this is good yeah we uh my band likes uh gilmore too by the way okay so uh we've it's reached the uh, the time where we're talking about pink floyd and that usually means it's time to to wrap up you maybe know? that'll be our topic for next week i think that could be our topic for many weeks well you know what we got to do until then be, be well be well yeah. Be well. Buy some merch and stuff. This is my retirement <laughs> plan. Let's get on it, dog on it. Okay. Be well, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye.